Kids Lakeland on our Church Center app or at lakeland.org. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and the authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Good morning, Lakeland family. It's good to see you. It's okay to say good morning. We're in church. Good morning. If you're at home, we're glad that you're here. If you're a guest and we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Dan, and I have the honor of opening up the scriptures today, which I'm going to do in just a moment. I just want to give one more shout. <coughs> Excuse me. That should go away in a minute. A shout out um, about the Behind the Walls event. About a year ago, we took a spiritual health survey as a congregation. And one of the things that that showed was 53% of us said, if we, could, if we would help you, you absolutely wanted to work on your sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people who didn't know him. Like you said, if you'll help me, I really want to work on this. And then when we asked, how could we help you? You said offering training, helping me become confident, uh, creating opportunities to share, and reminding us to go ahead and share. Well, behind the walls is actually the perfect answer to all four of those opportunities. Um, if you're willing to give a Friday night and about two-thirds of Saturday, um, my guess is you'll not only learn a way to share the gospel with people, you actually will. See, after the large presentation, the invitation is if you'd like to hear more, go find someone with a lanyard in the yard. So everyone you talk to has come to you because they want to hear about Christ. My guess is that many of you will be a part of actually leading folks to Jesus. Last night in Orlando, 143 people came to Christ in a jail, and 350-ish people rededicated their lives with the volunteers. I, my guess is that's what's going to happen. So I want to say, do not miss this chance to grow. Be, behind the Walls' mission is actually not just to reach prisoners, but uh, primarily to help equip the church to be effective in evangelism in our everyday lives. And you'll be helped. So this is a call to action. If you want to grow today, I want to encourage you to register for that event because that team will fill up. So i um, so very excited about that. All right. Look at somebody next to you and say, welcome to church. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> say, God has things to say to you today. Go ahead and say that. That's right. Have you noticed that sometimes as Christians we have to stand against, sometimes as Christians we have to stand against the current of our world? Have you ever experienced that before? Todd Habegger, my dear friend at Village, on his last message, he talked about, he, I'd see him at the Center Club all the time. That guy walked on the treadmill all the time, right? That's just, he, it's like he lived on the thing. He distinguished the treadmill from the people mover at the airport. People mover at the airport is moving, but you don't have to do much, and it is the easiest thing to just be right along with everybody else. How different from the treadmill, which he actually called the dreadmill, <laughs> right? Where you're spending a whole lot of energy just to stay where you are. Do you remember earlier in Colossians? Paul didn't pray that God would remove the challenges facing the church. He prayed that God would strengthen them through the Spirit of God who dwelled in them so that, they would, so that they would have endurance and joyful patience to face what it is that's difficult. But what is it they had to face? 
we look at that precisely today in our passage. This is the last passage that Paul gives to, I don't know what the the way is to say it, to help these young believers guard their understanding of every good thing they have in Christ. Now, after this, it's just fantastic next week. We start talking about what faith looks like and how we follow him in the world. But today is still about guarding this holy and precious faith that is ours. Some days in the world, we have to stand against it. Now, there are some Christians I know who are so against so many things their Christian, their Christian identity is almost about what they're against. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I don't think we're fundamentally against the people of the world for sure, and even the world in which we're living. God made it and will redeem it. We are fundamentally not against something. We are fundamentally for something. We are for Jesus Christ. And we want to help everyone we possibly can to know him, right? And we want him to be honored. So we're not called to throw up a wall and protect ourselves from the world we're in and every now and then throw down the drawbridge and run out and try to do whatever we can and then go back to safety. In the kingdom of God, there are no walls. We're called to enter the culture. Paul at one point said, to those who are under the law, I became like those under the law. To those who are not under the law, I became like one not under the law. To the weak, I became weak so that by all means possible, I might win some. Our job is to be in the middle of the world and be a carrier of blessing to every single person that we meet. That's what God has called us to. But some days when you do that, you're going to have to stand against the current. You, you can't. We cannot as Christians participate in those things which offend and uh, fundamentally dishonor the Lord. We're the ambassadors of his heart of his kingdom, and so we can't certainly go along with things in our world. And I think we all feel this. I mean, sit in the average American university philosophy class. Anybody ever done that? (laughs) Or even history class? And you're going to hear about the great evil that the church is to our nation, which to me is more than a little ironic because before the establishment of UW-Madison in 18, what is it, 1843 or something like that, did you know that every university established in America was actually established by Christians. They were established to be clergy training centers and to promote literacy because you have to be able to read, read the Bible. And so that's why Princeton and Yale and Harvard and all of the Ivy League schools and older schools all have divinity schools because that was the essence of their creation. So I find it kind of ironic that universities established by Christians now call Christians the great evil of all. But I'm just, I'm just saying, do you ever at work have to be careful about what you say about your relationship with God? Do you, do you ever feel like you take your job in your own hands? And I get it. If someone's come in for one service, your boss hasn't created this as a witnessing opportunity. I mean, I get that there is a propriety to honoring the relationship folks have stepped into. But with coworkers and at times, do you have to be careful about sharing Jesus? Or our youth retreat this weekend for our students was all about how in following Christ, you stand out in the world in which you're living. And as I talked to Seth yesterday, you shared a couple of the things that the students said about how hard it is and what that looks like. Well, this is not a new thing. Ever since God rescued anyone from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light, we recognize we still live in the domain of darkness. And we're there because we have a purpose to be there. And the Lord wants us to learn to stand in it. Alistair McGrath once said the 20th century gave rise to one of the greatest and most distressing paradoxes of human history— The greatest intolerance and violence of that century was practiced by those who believed religion causes intolerance and violence. (laughs) I just think that's funny. There's intolerance and violence against the church because supposedly the church is intolerant and violent. That irony is significant. Not a new challenge. In fact, the early church, the young church in the small town of Colossae, 120 miles, 10 miles east of Ephesus, was feeling the same sort of pressure. They were feeling like Paul was writing so they would stand against social pressure. That's what it was. Now, it wasn't secular in some of the ways I just described for us. It was spiritual, but social pressure is social pressure. And it's an incredibly powerful thing when the people you live among hold a value and express pressure for you to join it. God made us in his image. God is Father, Son, and Spirit. So one God in community with himself, when he made us in his image, he made two of us. 
how we relate to the people around us in God's plan is incredibly powerful, which can be for good, but when corrupted in the world in which we're living, it turns to bad. And so he's calling the Colossians to be aware, even though it's hard, you have to stand against the social pressure you're facing. Here are the commands. Do not let legalists pass judgment on your faith. They're legalists passing judgment. Don't let them do that. Don't buy it. He's going to say, don't let the hyper-spiritual tell you that your faith is disqualified, that you have lame faith because you don't have what they have. Don't do that. Don't fall for that. Don't let the impress, don't be impressed by the dramatic commitment of those who are in a false religion be, who are comparing themselves to you. Don't be sucked into thinking you're missing something. Paul is wanting to protect this faith. So our main point today is this, Christ followers must stand against social pressure. And friends, one attribute, I mean, we're to, we're to characterize humility and servanthood and kindness and love and courage and conviction. Those things too, strength is actually to characterize our lives. And that's what it is that Paul wants to have growing in these believers here. So we're in Colossians chapter two. If you have a Bible, open up to it, please. Um, it's page 572 in the Bible underneath your chair. By the way, I'm sitting in a chair because about two and a half weeks ago, I had a kind of a major surgery and my body this last week reminded me I am still recovering. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just trying to be wise. I am, this is a holy thing I do and I don't take it lightly. So I'm, I'm not being relaxed. I don't have a place to put my feet up and <laughs> in a park lounger or anything. All right, here we go. Colossians 2.16, Paul says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to the festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Social pressure form number one. Social pressure form number two. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, who is Jesus, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from Christ. Social pressure three. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of this world, why? As if you still live or are alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they're used, according to human precepts and teachings, these have, these have indeed the appearance of wisdom, in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. There are days when we have to stand against social pressure. That's what Paul's saying. So let me take us back through these forms one at a time. First of all, verses 16 and 17. Christians, resist giving in to judgmental legalists. You may bump into judgmental legalists sometimes. Resist giving in to the system they have and the declaration they make. So in this case, verse 16, therefore let no one pass judgment on you on questions of food and drink. Probably these are Jewish now believers and their entire culture and life has been given to kosher laws, things you eat and don't eat. And so when it comes to kosher laws, don't let people pass judgment on you, Christians, because you don't obey them, or with regard to the festival, a new moon, or Sabbath. The Hebrew, the Old Covenant had an entire calendar of worship the Hebrews were expected to participate in. And so when the, the Christians who were in Colossae, who were all Gentile, who didn't grow up with the Old Testament, right? When people joined them who were Jewish, they, they didn't abandon the Old Testament. They drug with them into their faith these commands that were in the Old Testament without recognizing that, in, in fact, many of them had been fulfilled by Christ. Simple rule of thumb. If Jesus Christ or if the New Testament doesn't command it, the command has probably been fulfilled in Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, for instance, did Jesus command dietary regulations? I mean, Paul at one point says, it's not what goes into your, in your mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your heart, right? So dietary regulations, not the same. We don't, uh, in the Old Testament, if you wanted to become a member of the people of God, you had to basically become Jewish. But in the New Testament, the festivals that were being practiced in the Old Testament also seemed to be filled with Christ. 
So the Passover. We don't celebrate the Passover today the way the Hebrews did. I'm personally glad for that because the priest was right in the middle of killing all kinds of animals. Anybody glad we don't do that anymore, <laughs> right? Like, that'd be my job. I just want to tell you, I am so grateful that Christ has fulfilled this. We don't have a physical temple. Why don't we have a physical temple today? Point to the temple of Jesus Christ. You should have two hands going, one like this and one like this. We are not temples. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Each of us, two of us together, all of us together. God is more present to us when we're, get, we're together. So the temple has been fulfilled. So much of what we find in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. Manna, which was celebrated um, in a festival for the Israelites, it was in the middle of that that Jesus stood up and said, I am the bread, not for a day, but of life. That pointed to me. So much of what these now Jewish Christians were still practicing were things that were fulfilled in Christ. Jesus didn't say the Old Testament's irrelevant. It pointed to him. But at many points, it's been fulfilled. Nevertheless, they were coming to these Christians and they were saying, you're not obeying at all. And the Christians were believing it. They weren't realizing everything that Jesus had accomplished for them, which we find in the New Covenant. So verse 17, what a beautiful statement. These are a shadow of the things to come but the substance is Christ. Praise be to God that that's the case. Paul's saying to these younger believers, don't you buy it for a minute that if someone tells you you're missing something Christ didn't command, that you're inadequate. Christ has done this work. Now, most of us probably aren't facing Jewish legalism as a challenge for us today. But I will tell you, I think actually legalism is still alive and well. I think we are all inherently legalists. What is legalism? Well, legalism, I think... Um, how does it develop? Maybe this is the way to say it. Legalism is giving a great deal of attention to highly visible, relatively superficial markers of spirituality. So, for instance, it might unfold in this way. A generation says, the Lord calls us not to lust, and we genuinely don't want to. Old and New Testament, yes, absolutely, still alive today, don't lust. And so that generation says, boy, can I just be honest? The one, I mean, I didn't have an internet, right? I didn't have the TV, but one place that I struggle when it came to lusting is dancing. And so I'm not saying dancing is a sin, but out of wisdom, can we put a fence around the command so that it keeps us from getting anywhere near the command? Someone, someone might say, is, is drunkenness a sin? Yes or no? Yeah, absolutely it is. So they say, I don't want to get anywhere near drunkenness. Can, how about if just out of wisdom, we don't ever drink anything? And a fence gets put around. And it's understood. It's a nuance. The reason I'm not drinking anything is I don't want to get anywhere close to what is actually the sin. Well, guess what happens a couple generations later? When you've heard the fence again and again and again, what was wisdom now becomes the line for sin. And so you've heard people say things like dancing is a sin, drinking is a sin, and maybe not so much now, but in fundamentalist churches once upon a time. And it's like, where did that come from? What starts from a good heart comes from missing the truth of what it is that sin is. Sin isn't, sin isn't my, well, let me just share an example and you'll get the sense. I was at a camp in Michigan. I'd spoken at it several times. I was driving by, so I stopped in and there was, there was a guy that was up front speaking. You know that little, that little guy who stands by your, the door of your mouth and says, you should think about that before you say it. Do you, do you all have one of those? I do, most times. Some days he goes on vacation, right? Some, some just, I'm not thinking, I just bloop, out it comes. So this man up front, he was speaking to a room full of folks. There were 150, 200 folks. <coughs> and he was going on and on and on about the sin of drinking it all. I'm sorry, Jesus made wine. <laughs> okay. And what... I reacted, what came out, and I, I'm not going to fight for my right to drink, right? If I'm around somebody that struggles, I, I don't, fine, that's, I'm not going anywhere near that. But what this man was doing was, I'm not going to say it was more than Jesus, because you can't be more than Jesus, it was different than Jesus. And so he said it, and I, I just said, that is not in the Bible. I, I just, I didn't yell it, but I just said it. Well, the guy next to me clearly knew the speaker, he was in the back, and, and he heard it, and then we suddenly had a moment, and he sort of fumbled for a little bit, and he felt bad for his friend, and he wanted to defend him. So he said, you know, my friend just has a little bit higher standard than Jesus. What can I say? <laughs> I don't think so. 
Legalism isn't holier than the holiness that Christ calls us to. Holiness ought to show up in all kinds of physical demonstrations, but the core of holiness is in the core of your heart. That's why Jesus said the two greatest commandments, as he summarized the old covenant, were love, love. The Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. If holiness isn't at your core, it's a mask. Legalism doesn't address the heart. Nevertheless, we can so easily get caught up in the pressure of people to define our Christianity by markers of spirituality that don't come from him. What makes a Christian a good Christian? Sometimes that's not defined by him, and it's powerful. Here's a, a perfect example. Barnabas and Peter were in Antioch, and they were doing what Jesus wanted. They, the gospel crosses ethnic boundaries so that if you share Christ in common, Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. You're, you're in the same body. You're in the same church. You're in the same family. And one of the manifestations of that was that in the old covenant, see, when God created a nation through Abraham, he wanted the nation to be distinct. And so he, he gave dietary regulations and he gave a calendar of practices. And he said things like, do not eat with Gentiles as a way of marking them as distinct. But when they were pointing to something and when the gospel came, there, if you share Christ in common, you are one. And so Peter and Barnabas were sitting down and eating meals gladly with Gentiles until some Judaizers, some legalists from Jerusalem came and looked at them with a sense of judgment. And even Peter and Barnabas pulled back from the Gentiles. Paul confronted them for this, we hear about in the book of Galatians. So it is a powerful thing to have a group of people define spirituality by highly visible, relatively superficial things and buy it. And Paul's saying to, to us, don't do that. Have the courage to trust the holiness that Christ calls us to and not think you add to it. That's pressure number one, social pressure one. Social pressure number two comes up in verse 18. Christian, resist buying the inadequacy of your spiritual life because someone tells you it is so. I'm, I'm not saying we don't want to press in to know, the, even we've seen this, we're to grow in knowing the Lord. So I'm, I'm not saying you're done in knowing the Lord. But be careful when someone tells you that your faith is inadequate if you have Christ. Most, most scholars think now Paul's not talking about Jewish legalists, he's talking about something else. He's talking about people who have come to Christ who were pagans, who were practicing what was called an early form of Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a pagan belief that everything physical is bad, including in us, and we have to distance and differentiate our spirits from this lowly body, and you can do whatever you want with your body because it doesn't really affect your spirit. But if you gain certain knowledge, you gain this sort of freedom. It's a little bit like the force, right? There is some alignment with that. It has nothing to do with Christianity. Um, what is true, though, is that the Gnostics apparently had a fair number of supernatural experiences to talk about. And so we read in verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels and going into detail about visions. These Gnostics had stories to tell about supernatural engagements with spirits, and a lot of them. And they were saying, man, you're, <laughs> can I just be honest? You're pretty lame compared to the liveliness of what it is that we've experienced. Let me tell you about this moment when this angel, I, I mean, I saw an angel do things, and the assumption of the ascetics is that if it's supernatural, therefore it must be from God. That's not true. It is not true that because something supernatural has come from God. Clearly that was the case in this situation. And because of it, if you say, I'm going to seek a supernatural experience no matter what, uh, you'll find it because the devil would be glad to provide it for you. God wants me to, I mean, there are, I'll, I'll come back to, there are places for supernatural things. God wants me to worship him whether I feel him or not. You know what that's called? Faith. When you're just among the fiery ones, guess what? It doesn't take any faith to do that at all. 
It's when you don't, you have faith. So beware of pursuing spirituality. Let me just give an example. When I was, years ago, I read a book about a woman. I couldn't remember the name of it. Neither Lisa or I could. It was a woman who was, in quotes, a medical practitioner in a clinic in Mexico City that performed psychic surgery. Now, I found this description not just on the internet, but on a Facebook page, so I'm fairly sure that it's accurate. Okay. <laughs> This is what psychic surgeons say. This, and I, it's pretty much now been debunked. But there was a time that it was really growing in its, in its popularity. Psychic surgeons are gifted healers that have been blessed with the ability to completely melt or remove cysts, tumors, calcium deposits, pus. I just think it's great they added pus. Energy blockages and more from the body of the, of the patient. They can also help with serious major diseases from the heart, the liver, adrenal system, thyroid, and more. They are able to supply you with a massive dose of healing energy. Anytime I see massive in, in a medical document, I just don't want to read anymore. A massive dose of healing energy and powerful enough to fight your diseases and boost your immune system. So how does, it, how does psychic surgery work? Have you ever seen these guys? They'll like start rubbing your abdomen and all of a sudden blood will be there and then boop, out, will, out will pop a supposed tumor, which when it actually is investigated, turns out to be like a chicken heart or something like that. But that's what this scene looks like. But here's what they say. The psychic healer connects with the mind of the patient on the subconscious level, thereby conducting the surgery based on the laws of quantum entanglements <laughs> done at the etheric and astral levels. Everyone goes, oh. <laughs> this is important. They channel their guides during the operation. So they say there is a spirit who is being channeled by the surgeon. And this powerful spirit does this work. The spirit simply proceeds to tune the body, remove blockages, present unwanted matters at the surface of the body. When the surgery is finished, the body will, the body will close with no unsightly scar. <laughs> Nothing like that will be visible. The patient can get up seconds after treatment and resume normal activity. So the woman who was participating in this, she, there was a picture of Jesus on the wall. And this was being conducted in the name of Jesus. And there was, there, there was more than just trickery. I'm not going to dignify it by even explaining. There were clearly supernatural things that were taking place around this. And not one of them had to do with God. So she finds Francis Schaeffer. Francis was still alive, the apologist. Goes to Labrie. And she tells him this story and says, on the one hand, there's, I think this is about Jesus, but there are some things about this I just don't think are right. And Francis challenged her, I dare you to read, I dare you to read 1 John and see whether the Jesus that you're participating with is the same Jesus as the Jesus of the Bible. And what she discovered, there were demonic manifestations. I mean, it was hairy for her for a while. And she, she concluded, absolutely not. There was nothing of Christ in it. You know, there are spiritual beings that are a part of Native American worship. Take peyote. There are all kinds of systems outside of the church that call us to supernatural things. And when, you're, when you see supernatural things, it, I mean, isn't our tendency, unless you're a narcissist, our tendency is always to struggle feeling like we're inadequate. So when you see something supernatural, it's hard not like a lemming to just run to it. And that's what was happening in the church in Colossae. Paul diagnosed these people by saying they were puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. There was no discipline in their mind to stop and think, well, what's the faith that's behind this? And not holding fast to the head. But as a Christian, Paul's already shown us in this book, the creator of the universe who sustains all things, he has indeed died for us so that we could be reconciled to God and united us among the people of God. And what can you add to him? Absolutely nothing. So he's saying to those who are being tempted by this, don't for a moment let them tell you that you're disqualified. Now, let me be clear. What I am not saying is that there is no supernatural dynamic to the Christian life. If you know me at all, you know that's, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, we saw last week when you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit makes us alive to him. So, something changes. And it's unique and different for all of us. But suddenly, I, when I came to Christ, I loved the name Jesus. I loved him. I saw the Bible, and instead of being, being di di distracted from it, it was like the magnet just, boom, I just wanted it. I couldn't 
get enough of the Bible. Anybody say amen if you've ever experienced that, this desperate, well, that's, that's not you. That's something happened in you. And then you enter this life where there are times when you're engaged in worship and you just know he's here and, and you start doing things like praying and seeing God answer prayers. Here's, here's one example. When I was our youth pastor for 12 or 13 years, this was a, this was a week, actually two weeks, that rocked my world. What rocked my world was this. We used to have a bus I bought from a camp in, in Wisconsin for $1,800. <laughs> Caught on fire twice. I love that bus. That, yeah, that thing, that made us pray all of the time. That's right, Michelle, you were on that thing, right? <coughs> so we were going to work at a church in the inner city of Detroit. I just wanted to take our kids across the cultural line and serve. And so the first week we did a VBS at this church and Great Commission Baptist Church just inside the Detroit lines and we did some things in the building and so forth. But on the way, one of my staff suggested before, how about if we have the students pray the whole way there? which in that bus was eight hours, <laughs> get to Detroit, eight-hour drive. We have four families, we call them, a guys and girls team. Let's just family by family, half an hour at a time, let's have them pray. You know, the honest, my first thought to that, I didn't say it out loud, but my first thought is, what if it doesn't work? I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that. I don't know what not working is, but that was calling our kids to rely on God at a level I'd not asked before. But I totally got shamed into saying, great idea. I mean, I, I can't say no to that. And so sure enough, we, we started out on our journey. And the kids prayed. And the more they prayed, as happens, the more they prayed. And students would get through their first half hour and say, that was half an hour? And then they'd say, can I join the next team and keep praying? And before we were done, almost the entire bus was praying the last hour, an hour and a half. That night in worship... It was like Jesus was walking in our midst. Like we were in the middle of the fiery ones. There were three or four kids that came to Christ that night and there, there, wasn't a, there was no altar call, right? We just worshiped and they experienced the presence of God. And because of it, the kids that had this experience, you know what they kept doing when they weren't doing VBS or they, were, they would pray. They would like circle up with their team and let's just pray some more. And then they had half an hour free or 40 minutes free, and they're like, let's, let's go with our adult into the neighborhood and see if we can help somebody. And they'd have a story to tell about bumping into this person who had this need, and one of them could talk to them about some change that had happened and about the church we were at, and suddenly this person wants to come to church. There was just story after story after story. I mean, if you actually see God answer your prayers, guess what you do? You pray more. The second week, we go to this camp. Same camp, actually, I, was, I already told you about, but I was there to speak to this group of Baptist General Conference students, 200, 250 kids, something like that. And so I brought our students along and their sole mission was to engage in the ministry of intercession for my speaking. And they prayed. And at one point, day two or three, this kid goes running by me on this path. His name is Brad. Brad is that kid who always forgets things. Camping trip, I forgot my sleeping bag, right? Bible study, I forgot my Bible, right? I mean, it's just always. He was always, right? So he goes tearing by me. He's got this look of terror on his face. And I said, Brad, what is it? And he said, oh, we got to pray. And I said, stop, what is it? And he, <coughs> out of breath, he's heading down to the beach. He said, I was out in the middle of the lake, this 50-ish acre lake, and a kayak, and I flipped over, and my glasses fell off, and my dad is going to kill me. We have to pray that God would give these glasses back. Guess what I thought? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this is going to be God teaching you responsibility. That's what, that's what I thought. I didn't join him. I went back to my cabin. The little twerp. <laughs> so he gets a handful of kids on the beach and they pray, God, give us back our glasses. And the lifeguard swims out in the middle of this lake and yells back about here. And Brad says yes. And he turns over swims down eight feet to the bottom of the lake, sticks his hand in the muck, and the first thing he touched were that kid's glasses. Wow. Now, here's the important part. They were just glasses. That wasn't about getting glasses. That was about helping a youth pastor actually come to believe in the power and the presence of God. That's what that was about. And when that story got told in that camp that night, guess what? We worshiped among the fiery ones again because the group believed now, the Christianity God calls us to has a supernaturality, is that a word, to it. But 
the Holy Spirit's favorite subject matter is Jesus. And if, if they're supernatural things, guess what he's doing? He is bringing us into the presence of Christ and he is, he's helping us to see and to savor and to be overwhelmed with the wonder of God revealed in his Son who is present with us right now in the Spirit of God. The supernatural work of God makes us want Jesus more. It makes us want holiness, right? So I'm clearly not saying that there is no spiritual dynamic, but I will say there are times that God doesn't touch us like that. And why would he do that? And the answer is he wants to grow our faith. That I would seek him just as earnestly when I don't feel him as when I do is called faith. So if you say, I'm going to seek a spiritual experience no matter what, you actually get into dangerous ground. And if you're around somebody who does that, sometimes what can happen is, again, I, I think spiritual things can happen, but that group definitely sits in judgment of your lame faith because you don't experience them all the time. And so Paul, and, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And so Paul says to us, don't let someone disqualify you because of their hyper spirituality. The truth is that he links us to Christ, the head, in whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through the joints and ligaments, grows in a growth that comes from God. The Holy Spirit unites me to Christ through whom the life of God is at work in me. Christian, you are in a great place. You may need to know him better. Sure, you may need to know better the God that you already have, but you are in a fantastic place. Don't you ever let someone tell you you're not. Third form of social pressure. So beware of judgmental legalists or hyper spiritually, spirituality and false religions. Third pressure, Christians resist being impressed by the high commitment of false religions. Now, let me tell you a story here first. Jehovah's Witnesses don't come to our house as much anymore. I don't know if they're not as zealous or they keep records or what, but when they, when they come, do, 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 yes, oh, oh, yes. We're here to, with the watchtower, and we're, we'd like to talk to you about God. Are you interested? Why, yes. <laughs> I would love to talk to you about God. And I don't know that I've ever made progress with any of these folks, but I'm, man, I'll talk to them. Let's just open up the Bible and see what the Bible actually says. They have no concept of grace and assurance whatsoever. So just go there. But having said that, almost every time I find myself asking the question, why did you become a Jehovah's Witness? And almost all of them say they used to be in the church, which typically is a church that's not that committed to doctrine and doesn't have much zeal and so forth. I had one said, you know, I used to sing God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And then I find out that's not in the Bible. And I'm like, uh, uh, you maybe haven't read it that closely, <laughs> okay? Why did you become a Jehovah's Witness? They all say, because I saw such zeal in these people and I thought that was right. They were committed or, and I'm not a stone thrower, but I'll, I'll just name a name. There is a church in Chicago, this, this sister church in Boston, the Chicago Church of Christ. I think it actually approaches or has crossed the line of being a cult. We have several folks in our church family who used to be there, who today would say, and that day they were so drawn to how committed these people were. But that commitment was highly visible, relatively superficial legalism. One brother that's in this room who had that experience said, it isn't until I came here that I actually started to love Jesus, right? So commitment can be appealing. And I think that's what it is that's going on in this text. Verse 20, if with Christ, Paul says to the Christians, you died to the elemental spirits of this world, why? As if you were still alive in the world, you submit to its regulations. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish, as they're used, according to human precepts and teachings. Here it is, verse 23. They indeed have the appearance of wisdom. It's like, wow, those people are committed, and that's really commendable. Okay, granted, I get that, but don't be fooled by the high commitment of someone who is nevertheless committed to a false faith. Right? It is the appearance of wisdom promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity of the body. Right? The truth is, I would hope no cult could ever outcommit us. If anybody has a reason to be utterly committed, take my life, Lord, let it be. All my silver, all my gold, not a mite what I'm... If anybody ought to be that way, it's us. But the Lord was really clear to say, if you're fasting, shower. 
<laughs> right? Don't let everybody see you bedraggled and then say, why are you bedraggled? Well, I'm fasting, right? Because dying to self is something we're supposed to do privately. In this moment, I'm not doing it privately anymore, but publicly, Jesus says, yeah, well, you pretty much have your reward in full now, don't you? He's pleased when our commitment is something that's not something that draws attention to us. And so in that spirit, Paul says, don't be fooled by people who have this high commitment and compare your life to them because they have no idea what actual faith really is. And Paul goes on to say, they, this, <coughs> this asceticism, it has no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What harshness in the body doesn't transform your heart. Jesus does. So Paul is saying, social pressure is going to come at you. You have to be able to stand against it. Now, let me, let me just pause. I feel like I have to insert this here. He is saying this to people who already he has said a number of things to. And it's because of what Paul's already said in Colossians that he's able to command us to live this way. So let me just remind us. Chapter 1, verse 4. He is speaking to people who have faith in Christ. He's not just calling us morally to not succumb to social pressure. He's saying you have faith in Christ who has rescued you from the dominion of darkness, brought you into the kingdom of his son. And then Paul describes with as great a words as anywhere in the Bible who this Jesus is who did this. He is the invisible God made visible. I'm going to keep bringing us back to this text. Who when Paul looked at and saw, he talks about it in Corinthians, he was brought up to the third heaven, he saw him. He just knew he had authority over everything, visible, invisible, in heaven and on earth. He ruled it all. Paul looked at him and he knew he created all of it with the Father and the Spirit. Paul looked at him and knew not only did he make it once upon a time, but he holds it all together today. And he's the one who dwells in you. Okay, I'm, I'm going I'm to say that again, and you've got to give me an amen. And he is the one who dwells in you. Amen. My gosh. He's disarmed the spiritual forces of evil that want to condemn you. They have nothing more to say because you've been redeemed. It's us who are indwelt by the Lord, who have all, oh, just be who you are. This isn't, you don't have to find this strength in yourself. Believe the one who rules and don't compromise your faith in him. That's where he goes. Well, how do we respond to this? Let me just say, when social pressure comes your way, don't be surprised. Right? Don't be surprised and remember whose you are. So when judgment and disqualification and comparisons come your way and somebody says, yeah, what, what you have is so lame. And, and it, if it's, there's enough people who you respect go in that direction and enough ferociousness aimed at you, right? When that happens, it's easy for you to cave. You can cave. But take the weight of that and compare it to the weight of the fact that the creator of the ends of the earth has actually made you his child. How do they feel about you? How does the Almighty feel about you? Weigh those two. <laughs> Which one is weighty? Right? Weigh that difference. Because there's an anchoring in knowing, even though the, what's happened around me is bigger than me, I am in the hands of one who is bigger than all. Remember Drew Brees? Anyone remember Drew? He was the quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. When Drew, <coughs> he was a Christian, was invited by Focus on the Family in 2019 to be in on a video in which he joined in uh, Focus on the Family's invitation to bring your Bible to school day. So he's recorded doing this. And <laughs> the people in New Orleans exploded and not in a good way. The Big Easy, which is a magazine there, uh, wrote an article that says, Drew Brees records video with anti-LGBTQ religious organization and goes on to characterize focus on the family as hateful and discriminatory, which I just think is fascinating. How did Drew respond? He did respond. This was the tweet that he put out the next day. He said, I live my life by two commandments. Love God with all my heart and my mind and my strength and love my neighbor as myself. I hate no one. I believe I'm called to love and respect all people. Now, I don't know if the article writer was happy with that because he didn't apologize for saying he believed in the Bible. But he did actually, he was 
I think he dodged something in clarifying, I'm being called hateful and it's not true at all. There was a nuancing to a kindness without compromise. And you can take that stance when you realize you're in the hand of the Almighty, who is the bigger than the one that comes. So don't be surprised if it comes your way and remember whose you are. Second of all, can I ask, are you anchored to something that's more stable than public opinion? If public opinion has more influence on you, or if you're just, you just go where public opinion goes, you're not anchored in Christ. And it may be because you don't know him. Every week we have folks who are in all kinds of different places spiritually. And maybe that's you. You're here and you know you're looking for something and you don't know what it is. And I, I'm here to tell you, it is Jesus Christ. He's reaching out to you right now. When you have him, there is a stability that is not susceptible to public opinion. You're anchored, right? We saw it last week. You're rooted in drawing life from him because he has offered an incredible salvation. Anybody remember in 2010 the cave-in in Chile? Remember that thing that happened? Right, the notoriously unstable San Jose copper mine, northern Chile, 33 miners were trapped half a mile below the ground, three miles from the entrance, three-mile walk, because a piece of wasn't granite. It was, I can't find what it was. A piece, this rock about the size of the arch in St. Louis came free and just completely blocked the path, right? Everybody heard about it. It weighed twice the amount of the Empire State Building. These are guys who needed saving. Now, most people assume they were dead, but the mining company started drilling to see if they could find anybody. And 17 days later, while they were drilling their eighth hole, the drill bit was pulled out of the mountain and it had a, and it had a, it had a note attached to it. We are in the shelter. All 33 of us are alive. Well, that's funny to pull up. Well, the whole world heard about this. And suddenly, not just the entire Chilean government, but the entire world came to the aid of the rescue of these guys. If that's you, how, how much do you need help to be saved? Half a mile below the ground, right? I mean, you're like stuck. And so three drilling units were established. One of, <coughs> one of them drilled a hole to give food to the guys. Another one drilled a hole to get communication to the guys. And the third one, NASA was consulted, drilled a hole that enabled this one person at a time single capsule to be dropped half a mile down into the, into the Chilean mine. And one by one, all 33 of those guys were pulled out. You know, if that's you, just think $60 million back in 2010 dollars was spent at your rescue. Can I tell you there's one here today who is greater than $60 million in the drilling prowess of the entire world? His name is Jesus Christ. The greatest rescue mission that has ever been offered is this one because God himself came to rescue us from the darkness of our own hearts. And if you, if you feel like you're, you know you're looking for something, you don't know what it is, and you're being batted around by the wind of what everybody thinks and grasping for whatever you can, I'm just telling you, Jesus... Jesus died on the cross so you could become a child of God and he reaches out to you right now and he says, not pretend, not because you prayed as a child but it really didn't make any difference but right now in my life, I actually need you and want you and I say, help, help. I need your forgiveness. I need you to run and rule my life. I, I wanna invite you to, if you've never said that, to tell him, I want you to run and rule my life, and something will come alive in you <laughs> that is what you've always been looking for, and it's him. Not because he puts you in the middle of his world, but he puts himself in the middle of yours. That's the life we were called to. For all of us, can we be grateful today for the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ? Amen to that. We're going to continue to worship. Can we stand together as we do? And as we do, I want to encourage you to... Um, um, to say, Lord, do I get the salvation that I have? I want to get it fully. I want to believe fully in what you've done for me. I want you to rule in my life. I don't want anything to make me susceptible to the winds of pressure around me. I want to stand as a light in the world. If that's you, pray with me right now. And the prayer team will be in front. If we can pray with you about this, part of your life or any burden that you bring today. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you that you have given us your spirit so that we could be strengthened in the inner man, in the inner woman, in our inner self so that we would live in Christ by faith. 
that we would grow in endurance and joyful patience with thanksgiving in the face of pressure that comes our way because we're not anchored in public opinion, we're anchored in you. We're anchored in divine opinion. <laughs>